guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are in Matthew 9, Lesson 9. And yes, you know, to me, this is just fun because some of you are brand new to the Revive School. Some of you have been running with us for, I mean, technically it's probably been 119 days at least. Uh, you have been running and digging into the Word every single day. Uh, for those that haven't missed a day, just go ahead, raise your hand if you don't mind. Huh. Mm-hmm. Seems to be an issue in the studio right now. <laughs> Wait a minute, you guys have been recording with me every day. So how does this work? So here's the deal. We believe that the Word of God changes lives. Apparently not everybody. Anyway, I'm no, just kidding. No, that's not true. We believe it changes lives. We just might be one or two, two, two lessons <laughs> off. <laughs> here's what I love about this is that you could literally pick up at any given time. You could pick up as strange as it sounds in Leviticus and it could change your life. You could pick up in Deuteronomy and it could change your life. You could pick up in Matthew 9 and it could change your life because he, uh, what does it say in Hebrews 4? It says that this is alive and active and piercing, which means an active book. This, yeah, it's the most sold book of all time, but it also means, yeah, it's still meant to apply to our lives today. Yesterday, I think we showed that just even in our observations of Matthew 8, just by reading through Matthew 8, something that we probably have read over and over again, instantly that it can apply to our lives. And so I just want to say thank you for jumping in. It's been a full week here studying the Gospels. And just as a a quick review, remember, the one word that we have for Jesus in the book of Matthew is king. Here's what I love about this is is that you're going to see different uh, perspectives of Jesus as you go through the Gospels. And in Matthew, you're going to see Jesus' perspective as a king, and it's going to be a fresh perspective. You know, you think about this, you know, everybody's always wanting the next president. You're like, oh, this president's going to do better than the last one. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. They're always hoping for something better because we know that something better is coming. Well, ultimately, guess what? King Jesus is better. <laughs> he knows that we know that he can change your life now and in the long run. And so in Matthew 9, we're going to start seeing that tension even about the old hasn't been working, therefore we need the new to come in place. Now, just to get up to speed, to get to that point in Matthew 9, really the first couple verses at the very beginning, uh, hang on here, let me go to to Matthew 9, verse 1. Jesus is very simply, uh, he's talking about, he gets into a boat and he begins to, what do you know, do healing again. Don't you love this? Jesus is in the business of healing and he does this because he sees their faith of, of some friends. It's the famous paralytic story. And he says, have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. But it's because he saw their faith. And so Jesus is constantly, just makes me think of the centurion. The the, the servant was healed, honestly, I actually believe because of the centurion's faith. But then the same thing in Matthew 9, he sees the friend's faith and he says, your sins are forgiven. And so he continues this pattern. But in the middle of all of these incredible stories, we see in verse 9, Matthew 9, verse 9, lesson 9, Whoa, this is getting weird. Whoa. (laughs) Whoa. I'm sure that means something in the prophetic. (laughs) I'm sure Mindy would be excited. It's 9-9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Matthew is the one who wrote the book. Matthew is the one who wrote what we're reading. And he's sitting at the tax office. This is probably his place. And Jesus says to him, follow me. So Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, he got up and he followed him. I think it's a fair statement, though, that he's sitting in the tax office. He's sitting in the, in the, in the Israeli version of H&R Block, and he's heard about all these incredible stories. I believe word has spread all throughout the country, and Matthew has heard about this. I believe he's been watching and observing and listening and maybe even sitting and listening to his teachings. And so then it says in verse 10, this is what happened. While he's reclining at the table in the house, Many tax collectors and sinners came as guests to eat with Jesus and his disciples. Well, many tax collectors, that would be Matthew. Because of Matthew coming to know Jesus, the religious get all of their underwear in a bunch. And so they were upset. They were frustrated. They didn't like that the quote unquote Jesus was interacting with those that we wouldn't interact with. And so when the Pharisees in verse 11 saw this, they asked his disciples, hey, why why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then in verse 12, but when he heard this, when Jesus heard them interacting, he, he just jumped in. I would love for him to say, why don't you just ask me? I'm right here. I can hear your heart. I can hear what you're saying. Well, I can tell you I'm interacting with the tax collectors. I can tell you I'm interacting with the sinners because those who are well don't need a doctor, doctor, but the sick do. And I want you to go learn what this means. I desire mercy, compassion, and not sacrifice. And I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
you know, this is a backdrop, but this is how Matthew came to know the Lord. This is how Matthew began to follow Jesus. He saw Jesus interacting with the people that nobody wanted to interact with. And so what you have in Matthew 9, it's like this spirit of arrogance, tension. Like, why would you do this? And Jesus does it this. Oh, I don't like this. And then Jesus completely continues to do it this way. To me, when you follow King Jesus, when you follow the way of the kingdom, when you follow the way of Jesus, it's never going to look like the way of the religious. Ever. And I think the reason we need a revival is we've got to break off of the spirit of religion in America. It's like if we have, can I, can I just tell you this? It's like we have to have everything down to the minute. We have to have everything to a T, whether it's one day or one service. It's like, where is the freedom in all of this? No, 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 you don't understand. You can't pray longer. We don't, we don't need that right now. That's not in the script. And it's, if we're not careful, we become religious just like them. Now, look, you can say, well, I have reasons for doing this. I understand. You might be on television. You might be on radio. You might be on the Internet. I understand the logistical reasons. We're right there with you. But don't ever let that get in the way of doing ministry. Don't ever let that get in the way of, of ministering to people who drastically need the Lord. And dare I say, don't ever leave the building and never interact with the people. Jesus says, I desire mercy and compassion I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your offerings. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinners. And this is the context that, that Matthew started following Jesus. Isn't that awesome? He began to hang out with the, can I just say, the tattoos and the drinkers and all these guys that are smoking pot. I mean, that's the mentality that we have. And Jesus said, this is who I came for. You're like, oh, I got some tattoos. What are you talking about? Like, you get the point here, okay? Don't get all weird on me. I'm just, I'm emphasizing, if they don't look like you, that's probably who Jesus was hanging out with. <laughs> And so then in verse 14, this is how we transition. So you, first of all, you have the religious, they're all upset. And then guess what? It happens again. Then John's disciples, they came to Jesus. Now, when you hear John's disciples, who are we talking about? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So now I'm like, wait a minute, John the Baptist disciples? It, they, they shouldn't be like religious. Like that's my first thought. Like why do we and the Pharisees fast often? What was John the Baptist's message of baptism? Repentance. Repentance. So there was still a message that needed to be, can I just say, uh, clarified and cleaned up that needed to be saying, but it needs to change over to the way Jesus does it. So John the Baptist and even the Pharisees, and in fact, in Luke, sometimes it just says the Pharisees ask this question. So now we know that John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples, they're both saying, hey, we fast often. And in fact, some of us, we fast twice a week. But your disciples, they're not even fasting. <laughs> you guys apparently aren't that religious. So they are saying, hey, by the way, you know we're supposed to fast. Why are you, why are you guys not fasting? The law says we're supposed to fast. In fact, Moses, Mount Sinai, uh, right? In Exodus 34, he fasted for a whole long time, 40 days. We know that in Leviticus, you ready? This one's for you, Rich. In Leviticus 1.44, I did my research on this one. In Leviticus 1.44, if you'll go there, what? In Leviticus 11.44. I still did my research. That's some good I research. I just couldn't read my writing. <laughs> Leviticus 11.44, thank you very much. For I am the Lord your God, so you must consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. You must not defile yourselves by any swarming creature that crawls on the ground. Verse 45. For I am the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. So you must be holy because I'm holy. So he asks him to partake and to fast from certain animals. Okay, so there's a certain type of fasting from certain kind of animals. The Nazarite vow, right? Remember this? So if you're a Nazarite, take a Nazarite vow, number six, you're going to be fasting from certain things, alcohol, certain food. And then obviously to me, uh, the Pharisees, they, they, they pulled the card, you know, hey, we fast twice a week. So they have all of this religious mentality. We fast on this day. We have to do it on these days. And, and oh, by the way, this is why we're doing it. Now, Kent Burgess, one of my former professors at Dallas Seminary, he came up with fasting categories. So not just on these days, but I'm really trying to give you a backdrop of why these guys would have said, what in the world's the deal? Like everybody knows in our culture, you have to be fasting. So like, I want to pull the religious card on these guys. I want to say, oh yeah, you guys are just being religious. But the reality is that fasting was a part of their constant culture. Fasting was a part of their, their religion. 
And so to see disciples, tax collectors and sinners and fishermen not even fasting at all, you're like, whoa, whoa, this, this is not of the Lord. Because fasting, Kent Burgess says this, one is, is a, it's a sign of grief and mourning. Okay, there are seasons when you would grieve. Remember for 30 days you went fast, you wouldn't eat. Uh, fasting category, another one is it's a sign of repentance and you're seeking forgiveness for sin. So if these disciples of Jesus are legitimately in a, ser in a season of forgiveness for sin, they, they have to be fasting, right? If you're going to fast, you're, you're also saying, I am in aid of prayer, okay? Two more things that Kent Burgess says about fasting. And why I'm saying this, why I want to emphasize this, is because you're going to see a drastic culture shift with Jesus. When this kingdom, remember we talked about how we want a different type of kingdom. When this different type of kingdom comes in, it rubs everybody the wrong way that there's no way that that can be right. And so this fasting mentality, it also, I like, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's an experience of the presence of God that results in an endorsement of his messenger. So you might go through a season of fasting and all of a sudden the Lord begins to highlight and endorse somebody in that area that the Lord wants to send out, right? Like, I've commissioned you to do this. I've anointed you to do this. And then the fifth component of fasting that Kent Burgess says is that it's an act of uh, ceremon ceremonial public worship. People would come together for a big old corporate fast. These are the things, that this is the lens that John the Baptist disciples, that the Pharisees, they're like, look, man, you guys, I don't understand. You're not fasting. You're obviously not religious. And to some extent, their argument, even though I don't like it, they're actually valid because that's all they've ever known. So I bring this up because this is their argument. But in verse 15, watch how Jesus discusses and interacts with the religious. And we know specifically John the Baptist crew. Like the, you would think there'd be buddies, right? You would think, hey, there's John the Baptist guys. Hey, there's Jesus's guys. Hey, we're preparing the way for you. So why are we questioning each other, right? That's, that's what you would think. And in verse 15, this is what uh, Jesus said. Can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? Remember, one of the forms of fasting is, is because of mourning, right? Can the wedding guests, can the sons of the bride chamber, can the disciples be sad while the bridegroom, while they're with me? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. That would be Jesus. There's going to be a time that Jesus is going to be away from his, his groomsmen, right? <laughs> and then they will fast. But right now in this season, in this period of three years, guess what? Not right now. And honestly, you guys, that really radically rocks the boat. But do you guys know that John the Baptist got called the best man? Do you know this? It's kind of an interesting. Kevin, we go to John 3, 29. It's just kind of an interesting story. Uh, here you have the bridegroom. He's going to be taken away, right, from the bride eventually. And then this is, this is uh, look, what he's, look how he's describing him. John 3, 29, he who has the bride is the groom. But the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. Just kind of an interesting, wait, What? This is John the Baptist, the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him, right? Rejoices greatly at the, at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. We're talking about a wedding. And as we're at the wedding, you've got the best man, John the Baptist. You got Jesus and he's telling all the groomsmen, by the way, guys, I'm out of here. But when I'm out of here, that's when you can fast. But while I'm here, let's not. I don't know. I, I just think this imagery to me, it's all about Jesus as the bridegroom. Kevin, can you go to Isaiah 62, verse 5? Isaiah 62, verse 5. And you're going to see a couple images. For as a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you. And as a groom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. It's a simple image. Go to one more, Hosea 2, 20. Multiple Old Testament versions talk about messianic passages being Jesus being the bridegroom. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness and you will know Yahweh. You're going to see constantly this relationship between God and Israel. You're going to constantly be seeing Jesus as the bridegroom. And Jesus is saying, hey, while I'm here, let's celebrate. <laughs> let's, enjoy, uh, let, let's rejoice who I am. And I'm hesitant to use this word, 
but I'm going to do this, okay? I believe, Nelson, as Nelson's commentary says this, that as Jesus is introducing this type of fasting, I believe he's already introducing to John the Baptist disciples, to the Pharisees, a new dispensation. Now, I'm careful when I say that, okay? All I'm trying to say is this, okay? Is that we're going to go from a period of a rule of law, and then guess what's greater than that? God's grace. Everybody has functioned right here by the rule of law. But now all of a sudden we're saying that God's grace trumps all of that. And when you're in a spirit of religion, you don't fathom or understand grace at all. Everything is about to do. Everything is about, hey, I got to get this done in order to get this done. And in verse 16, he begins to spell it all out. This is what I'm talking about in, in, in grace. He says, no one patches an old garment with an unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. I know, let's go to you guys here for a second. Describe this for me in verse 16, will you? Describe why would Jesus talk about clothing and what, how does this even fit? I think about Michelle's grandma patching an old pair of jeans. She wouldn't go get a new piece of denim. She'd use a piece off of the old, an old pair of jeans and patch it in one they had been holes, but then when it you wash it, it's not going to shrink at a different rate. So it's going together instead of one behind the other or ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one aspect is that he's, he's trying to use terms and things that they would understand. So these are things that they would use regularly, you know, whether it be patching their clothing or or making wine, they, they would understand these terms and, and the idea of doing that would be, they would go, well, duh, you wouldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, you would not put, let's just make it super simple, you wouldn't put a new piece of cloth on old material. Eventually, the scripture says, that will pull away. And so what, he, what he's, why this tie though, Rich? I think you can tie this in for us. Why would he use this image in regards to, we've been talking about fasting and religion. I think he's just talking about there's a there's just a new way of doing things. The the it's like the old is past and behold there's new things that are coming and, and it's through me. It's not the way that you used to do them. Yeah. There's a new way of doing things. So you guys might have been doing fasting this way for a long time. And we're not actually saying that it's bad, but now there's a new way of doing things. And I'm trying to implement to you guys right now in this season, don't try to don't try to like make them fit together in some ways. And just one more image, and then I think we can put all of this together. Because Stanley Two Saint says, the old cannot contain the new. The old cannot contain the new. And that goes along with uh, the second image that he gives, besides the garment and the patch, he goes with the wine and the wineskin, right? And this is what he says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined but they put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserved. You know what I hear in that? Just in an observation standpoint, I see the word new <laughs> and I see the word fresh. And honestly, I feel like that's the perspective that Jesus brings to the table. Now, I'm gonna read something that it has nothing to do with make me feel smart. I just wanna read what John MacArthur writes about the wine and the wine skin. And it helped me understand this illustration. This is what MacArthur says. He says, animal skins were used for fermentation of wine because of their elastic elasticity, okay? As the wine fermented, pressure built up stretching the wine, stretching the wine skin. As uh, previously stretched skin lacked elastic elasticity, it would rupture, ruining both wine and wine skin. Jesus then, what MacArthur says, is he uses an illustration to teach that the forms of old rituals, I think that's really important, such as ceremonial fasted, fastings practiced by Pharisees and John's disciples, they're not fit, you ready for this? For the new wine of the new covenant. So these things can no longer contain the new wineskin that he's bringing. It's time for a new season of new wineskin. And I'm just going to tell you, I think in the church, we, we need it. We get so stuck sometimes in our rituals, in our routines. Guys, we got to start thinking outside of the box. I'm not talking about a new covenant. I'm just talking about, Lord, what do you want to do that's different? 
And Kevin, if you would, would you go to Colossians 2, verse 17? Colossians 2, verse 17 says, there are, These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is the Messiah. These things that we're talking about, they're a shadow of what was to come. And well, here's the best part as, we're, as I was praying through this uh, and studying this. Can you go to Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33? The Lord just took me there. You guys know these passages. Jeremiah 31 through 33. Now remember this. The Pharisees that had a hard time with this. They're a small legalistic set of Jews. There's about 6,000 of them. Okay. All they know is that they've been separated. They're not isolated, but they're separated. Okay. They represent what one commentator says, the orthodox core. So if there's any group that's going to hold on to the old wineskin, the old garments, it's going to be the Pharisees. They're going to hold on and say, no, 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 there's no way that the covenant that we've been established with Moses, there's no way that there's something else. But they got to understand in Jeremiah, the prophet, he says, oh, yeah, there is. I am talking about the wineskins here. He says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I, did you see this? I'm going to make a new covenant. There's going to be a period of grace that's going to come. It's going to come through new garments, new wineskins. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant. And this one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke even though I had married them. There's the image, you guys. The Lord's declaration in verse 33. Instead, this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. The Lord's declaration. And here's what Jesus is talking about. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. The old wineskins cannot contain the new covenant. I'm going to put it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Crazy enough, you could say, well, that was Jeremiah the prophet. But Ezekiel says the same thing. Kevin, if you would, would you go to Ezekiel 36? He talks about this new wineskin. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'm going to remove your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of of flesh. There's a new covenant coming in verse 27. Ezekiel says this, I will place my spirit, ready, within you, and that will cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Once the spirit is inside of us, then we'll be able to express this. The problem is, is back at that point, everything was external and that's why we did it. There's a new covenant. There is a new season in all of this. And I think to me, uh, it's an incredible picture that when you're open to the new wineskin, you ready for this? Radical change can happen. I've been asking the Lord, Lord, where, where in all of this, like, where do I see this actually happening? Well, we have John the Baptist, right? The disciples, they're having a hard time with this. Can you go to Acts 19? But you see what happens is that when you work with the religious, God can still move in that community. If you work with the religious and you say, guys, I want to graciously walk with you. I believe change can come to anybody. People that are stuck in legalism, people that are stuck in Sunday mornings, and that's it. People that are stuck on only Wednesday nights. You guys, the spirit of God is in us in every single day. But when you begin to understand at one point you were in that place, at one point you were in that posture and somebody helped you, you guys, that's our desire. We want to set people free from this bondage of the old way of doing things. In Acts 19, that's exactly what happens. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and he came to Ephesus. He found some disciples. Now watch. And he asked, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No. <laughs> we haven't even heard there's a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism were you baptized with? He asked them and what did they say? With John's baptism. So here you have John's baptism. All they know is this way of life. We don't even know about the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, right? This is what we've talked about. Telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after them. So you know about that there's Jesus coming after him. In verse 5, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They didn't just check off these guys who said, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. What did they do? They poured into them and they did ministry with these guys. And then it says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know that that word baptized, it could mean multiple things, okay? In this context, you know, remember, remember John the Baptist said he's going to baptize them in spirit and in fire? It could mean at this context, I didn't study that exact word, but it also could mean just obviously water baptism too. But if you would go to verse 6, because those that were free poured into the religious that were not set free, Paul then, it says, laid hands on them. Are you Look at this, you guys. You realize this? 
Paul laid hands on John the Baptist's disciples. After they got baptized in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came on them, and then they began to speak with other languages and to prophesy. I think if we're always pointing fingers, and I'm just going to tell you this, I get stuck and get mad at the religious, but part of our calling is to walk with the religious to set them free. And that was Jesus' whole goal. It's like, guys, you can't put something new onto this. But he says, come on, I want to help you learn how to do this. And he put hands on them. You, you, are you following me? And they actually began to speak in tongues. They were saying, speak in other languages. And they began to prophesy. In verse 7, Scripture says, Now there are about 12 men in all. 12 men got to, are you ready for this? They got to experience the new covenant. Paul didn't check them off and say, heck with you guys. No, no, no. He, he poured into them. So much so that this is how Revive School started. In verse 8 of Acts 19, there he entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly over a period of three months, engaging in the discussion and he's trying to persuade them about the things related to the kingdom of God. Do you guys understand this? Paul pours specifically into the religious to show them the new wineskin, to show them you cannot live with an old patch or a new patch on your old clothes. No, no, no. This is how the kingdom of God works. Jesus is coming to set you free. And for three months he tried. But you know what? After three months, look what happened in verse nine. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, they, di they didn't like the new wineskin. They didn't like the way the truth in the life. They didn't like it. Then Paul withdrew from this religious group after trying for three months and he met separately with the disciples. Remember, we know at least there was 12 of them and all of them have been baptized in the spirit. All of them began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And then what did they do? They began conducting discussions every single day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. I think this is important because what happened is over the course of time, if you go to verse 10, this went on for two years. Paul poured into a group of 12 men with the word of God and he pulled them from a spirit of religion and he embraced and walked into a spirit of freedom. He showed them there's a new way of doing things. And he did this for two years. Why? So that all of the inhabitants of Asia, it wasn't just for the 12 men. No, no, no. It was for the inhabitants of Asia, both Jews and Greeks. Remember what did we talk about at the beginning of Matthew 9? that the gospel is intended for tax collectors and sinners, that the gospel is intended for Jews and for Gentiles, right? We don't just embrace this spirit of freedom, this new wineskin for ourselves. No, we do it so that it says, all heard the message about the Lord. We want people to be set free. And I actually believe when you study the word of God on a regular basis, I believe your whole community can radically change. It's a, it's a simple, simple truth. I'm just going to highlight it, though. In order to understand how a community can change, you have to understand that the rule of law is trumped by a period of grace. And then in that, as strange and obvious as it sounds, you've got to understand, don't put old patches on new clothes. You've got to understand that God has a new wine for a new wineskin. And when you're intentional about studying the Word of God, I believe lives can change, including yours and mine. That's what Revive School is all about. It's not to, to get into a ritual. It's not to get into a routine. It's actually to embrace the Holy Spirit working in our lives so that more and more can hear about King Jesus. You know, this is uh, the gospel. There's a lot here. There's a lot more at the end of Matthew 9. But my prayer is that you'll dig in yourself and you'll do this every day with us. Thanks. Have a great day.